another installment of our Public Safety Innovation Webinar Series, and thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Arterberry of Advisage Technologies, your host for today's webinar. Today we continue our mini-series on the important topic of high-stakes testing. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. First, our topic today will run about 45 minutes with approximately 30 minutes of presentation and about 15 minutes for Q&A. Please feel free to enter questions at any time into the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Second, we're recording the webinar today so that you'll be able to watch it again or share it with others. So we'll send you that information in the very near future. Okay, before we get started, a little bit about us. Envisage Technologies is the leader in training and compliance technology for public safety professionals with over 1.3 million first responders using our technology. We ensure that our first responders are trained, equipped, and ready, and we're passionate about raising the bar on training. We provide this public safety innovation series because we're committed to improving public safety through awareness and innovation, and we want to help get great ideas and best practices, those that can save lives, out there and adopted. In short, we believe that readiness saves lives. Now, last week we kicked off our mini-series on high-stakes testing in public safety with a webinar that provided an overview of the issue of cheating. Today we're going to get a little more specific about how you can use technology to your advantage and ensure the integrity of your testing process so that lives are not lost. You hear about the why, the what, and how of creating a trustworthy examination process. To take you through this, we're fortunate to have two experts with us today. Ari Vidali is the founder and CEO of Envisage Technologies. In his 20 plus years in technology, Ari has been the lead founder and visionary for five high-tech enterprises. He's involved in building next generation training systems, cloud-based learning, records management, automation of high liability training operations, and pervasive readiness technologies. He's a committee member of the National Congress for Secure Communities and an advisory board member of IADLIST. Ari has also consulted for federal agencies, Homeland Security, Public Safety, Military, and Law Enforcement on technology, security, legally defensible records, compliance, and training. Fire Chief Clive Savakul has been in the fire service since 1996. He's held many positions, including firefighter, paramedic, engineer, captain, training chief, battalion chief, and vice president for the Firefighters Union and currently serves as Fire Chief for the Garden Valley Fire Protection District in Northern California. Clive is also a founder of Exposure Tracker, an app that tracks toxic exposure, injuries, and communicable disease exposure for firefighters. Ari and Clive, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. Clive, it's a pleasure to have you here, too. Thank you for having me, and thank you for joining in. So this is the second in our series, and everyone who's on the phone, regardless of where you're coming in from, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about, and having Clive here also, to talk to you a little bit about how to get ahead of cheating. For those of you that were in the first webinar, you heard a lot about some of the cases. For those that weren't present for that, I want to just cite a few examples of the kinds of things that are going on in public safety. Just to sort of recap, there are many, many examples of test, theft, and cheating in public safety. I'm going to give a, a couple of examples here in the fire service. In Boston, Massachusetts, uh, firefighters were caught using cell phones, uh, texting messages and texting test answers to their friends who were taking tests. In Orlando, Florida, top officers used a department radio to listen to candidates prior to taking the same exam themselves. In the policing world, uh, just another example there in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, one officer paid another officer to take a promotional test in his stead. So these are not isolated incidents out there. There's a lot of this going on uh, within the public safety world today. And so what we want to cover is how to get ahead of that curve. Back in the day, testing was pretty quaint, or cheating was pretty quaint, Clive, wasn't it? It was. Some of the uh, basic examples I could think of is just a proctor giving out the test to some of the candidates. Uh, an engineer's exam for my department years ago, my old department, um, one of the candidates had gotten a copy of the test from one of the raiders, and uh, he accidentally left it on his bunk when he got off duty. And so another firefighter came in, found the exact test 
it was to be used for the promotions. And so cheating back in the day up until recently before technology, it was really just the, the simple, simple human side of uh, somehow stealing the documents and, and using them um, with just writing them down like notes. You know, if you run a Google query for how to cheat on a test, you're going to come up with about 8 million hits. And what's astounding is the first one is actually a WikiHow article on how to go about cheating on a test. So these uh, technology-enabled millennials are sharing this knowledge in real time with each other to figure out ways to compromise tests. And the higher stakes the test, the more incentive there is for folks to cheat on that test. And, and really quick, along with that note, um, we look at these perspectives as cheaters from, you know, people my age that are chief officers, and we're thinking about how cheating occurred back in the day versus what millennials and, and um, people that are tech savvy are capable of. And so we need to adjust our mindset to be capable for the newer generations. So far, a far cry from writing the answers to a test questions on your shoe, we start to see uh, points of breach or points of access coming in through Internet access, obviously anything that can connect to the Internet, cell phones, smartwatches now are capable of an amazing amount of functionality. Pen scanners, we see audio devices, we see button cameras. You see some of those images there on the right. One of them actually shows you how to compromise a test using uh, proxies, so subject matter expert proxies, and a very small audio device in your ear to get audio, as well as a button camera or lapel camera that is going to be projecting the test question uh, to folks who are out in a car a little bit further away and providing the answers to the test question. So these are, are whole new vectors or attack vectors that we in the testing world and in the technology world need to be aware of as we go out and ensure that our high stakes tests are valid. I want to talk about two major issues. The first one is test theft, which is the primary source of the problem. So test theft is, uh, can be defined as uh, having the test files directly stolen. Uh, there are folks that are stealing individual questions this can happen in a variety of different ways, either by writing them down uh, or recording them in some fashion using digital recording devices. There are also tools and software that come on USB sticks that if you're in a computer testing lab, you can actually record the entire session of what that computer saw, everything that was on the screen and every mouse click and every keystroke that happened can be digitally recorded and then later used for playback. Uh, transcription, both digital and analog transcription, we talked about in the previous slide, we talked about the digital pens that can actually uh, record and transcribe the data from the test. Uh, compromises coming from insiders, subject matter experts, or people who were involved in test creation or who have taken a test in the past that are passing that information on. And one of the issues that we need to all be aware of is that a lot of the problems come from outsourced proctoring services. And the reason for that is that oftentimes there isn't sufficient quality control from an outsourced proctored service. And there are a lot of different vectors there for breaches to occur. Cheating happens in a variety of different ways. It, it begins with acquiring test materials. There are websites that share test materials, and in some cases, actually, it's turned into a lucrative business where folks are selling test materials for some amount of dollars per test. Colluding with an expert, that would be like the uh, example of the person with the audio and video a connection to the subject matter experts in the car, uh, using any form of test aid when that's not allowed, uh, using a proxy like the officer in Trenton, New Jersey, sending a friend who's an expert to go take the test on your behalf, uh, even hacking 
to change a score can be used uh, to change the outcome of a high-stakes test or copying answers in any fashion. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that we sometimes don't give our firefighters, police officers enough credit as far as what they're capable of. And so we, we make some assumptions that our tests are secure when we really have to broaden our perspective as far as what, what's possible. So if it's possible, we have to look at that there's a potential that could be a vulnerability. Human nature is to find ways around obstacles. The three top vulnerabilities in order of precedence are number one, people. Human beings are often uh, the primary source of data breaches. And whether it's a analog process, a paper-based process, someone forgets a test booklet somewhere. It's left lying around and somehow that test booklet finds its ways into the hands of prospective students who then copy it into a study guide and suddenly we have a compromised test. The second vector are the processes themselves that you're using to secure the test. Do you have policies? Do you have procedures? Somewhere along the way, those test questions are out in the open and become vulnerable. Another vulnerability is using paper. Paper cannot be encrypted. Paper cannot be as easily tracked. Uh, we don't know who has accessed it. So using analog methods uh, does provide some level of vulnerability to the testing process. So have you got anything on that? Yeah, and so we'll get into more detail as to how to, to tighten up these aspects. But what's, what's important to remember is that there's a linear relationship between how secure your test is and how much effort you put into making it secure. And so the more effort you put into restricting and keeping these things tight, the better your test is going to be. And there are enormous consequences, right, Clive, to not securing your test. Absolutely. When we look at the cost of putting on a test, sometimes they can be daunting, but the cost of a lawsuit, if our test isn't done right, if it's compromised, or if there's something that someone feels unfair, the cost of that lawsuit could far outweigh anything that costs just to prepare the test. So let's talk about the five points of vulnerability. This is when your test information can be exposed and what you should be thinking about in each of these stages. The five steps or the five stages are test creation. This is when we are actually creating the test instruments themselves. The second is validation, when subject matter experts are brought in to validate that these questions are well formed. Third is the preparation of the test. So once we have our questions, when we're actually putting them together into test instruments, the fourth point of vulnerability is when we deliver it and score that test. And the fifth is post-test, everything that happens after the test, be that student after action review or debriefing or anything that happens post the test. The Color coding here indicates the risk, the level of risk that happens during that point of vulnerability. It's lowest during the initial test creation because the fewest number of people have access to the materials, and it is highest when we have delivered uh, the test and post-test. We have the most number of eyes on that material at that point. Yeah, and I think it's also something to note that each one of these stages, you can see more people get involved as the process continues. And so with test creation, you might only have two people involved. And so as it progresses, the more hands it goes through, the greater the risk. So the three top things you need to consider when involved in test creation or the validation uh, of the test items themselves are, first of all, consider the legal frameworks within which you're operating and make sure that you have legal agreements binding confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements with everyone involved in this. Uh, one could also extend this to, at some level, copyright agreements for the test questions that gives you some leverage if these items are breached and are posted 
to actually recover some damages for breach of copyright. So the second thing is limit the test items on a need-to-know basis. So only those folks that need to know uh, that those particular test items should have access to them. And the third thing is to compartmentalize. And Clive, this is something that you brought up that is very important during uh, some types of test creation. So why don't you extrapolate on that? Yeah, so when we would put on tests, we would, we would treat it like an uh, intelligence a agency cell. And so only the, the proctors and raters that were involved with one aspect of that test, they would only be privy to the information that had to do with their station. They wouldn't know what was going on in the other stations and vice versa. That way the information is very much restricted, so it not only keeps it out of fewer hands, but if it does get leaked, we're able to trace it back to the source easier during an investigation. The next stage is preparation. So this is the moment when we are actually preparing the test instruments to be distributed to students. And during preparation, there's a couple of things to think about. In the old legacy world, we would keep one, two, three, or four distinct versions of a test on paper. It, it is ideal to prepare the test as close as possible to the delivery of the test so that no one has time to see what items are going to be on that test prior to its being delivered to students. So if you can auto-generate the test at the point of need, that's going to be a huge uh, win for you from a security standpoint. The second point is going to be to randomize those tests. So rather than having four discrete versions, randomize each one of these tests per student. And then thirdly, ensure that you have sufficient security from this test from the proctors. Once we have the test created, then we have some real uh, broader challenges because now we have the uh, largest attack surface, the, the largest number of people who are going to have eyes on that instrument. And so the first and foremost most important thing to do is to positively identify the students. Don't just assume because they're showing up. Uh, and they give you a name that matches a roster that they are who they say they are. Uh, make sure you get positive identification. The second thing, no electronics. And now that you've seen this presentation, you realize that there's more to it than asking them to hand over their cell phones. If you see a pen in their pocket, if you see a watch that looks like a smart watch, make sure that they surrender all of those items to you prior to getting into the testing center. The third thing, if you're using digital testing, lock your machines. Do not allow those machines to be used for anything but the test and make sure that the gateway in and out of that testing facility is locked to only allow access to the testing server. And fourthly, you have to monitor behaviors. So it's not enough for a proctor to just be there you need to start to monitor what's happening on those different machines that are out there to try and ensure that no cheating is going on. Yeah, and I'd like to tie in with the locking machines. Uh, when we look at the technology, we have to be able to sit in the courtroom and, and defend ourselves as far as how we put our tests together. And so when we look at the machines, we look at for a laptop, for example, if we uh, are, are on the defense stand and they ask us, you know, was this laptop ever used in a Starbucks with, with uh, community internet? Can you know for sure that your uh, laptop wasn't hacked and it wasn't compromised? And, and so if you have a machine that's simply just used for that test and you're not using it for other purposes, you can stand on the defense and say, yes, I'm certain this computer's never been compromised. And that kind of goes hand in hand as well with the validation and preparation of tests with copy machines. The more advanced copy machines, every time you copy something, it actually saves the document in the memory of the, the copy machine. And so when we would put on tests, we would have the consultant use their own copy machine off-site 
um, that they knew was confidential and restricted so that if we had to stand on the defense, we could say nobody's hacked into our copy machine and taken the tests out of our hard drive. Those are excellent points, Clive, and uh, very valid for people to remember, especially that one about the copy machine, several tests have been compromised through that mechanism. If you look at a proper proctoring center, again, the proctor is the gate. He's the gateway into the actual testing service or the testing center. And that in-house proctor has a couple of roles, one to be gatekeeper and to ensure the identity of that individual through either biometric ID scan or digital photo. But the software, the, the, the tools that are being used and the machines that are being used are the ones that have to be locked down. So it's a combination of having a proctor with a, a good solid policy and the right technology on the back end to run the test. In the post-test, this is the moment where a lot of people have had their eyes on the content. So there's a couple of things that are very important, and also for those of you that are IFSAC and Pro Board uh, that are with FIRE to understand the policies surrounding all of these different moments in, from test creation all the way to post-test. The key things to think about after the test has been administered are number one, to lock the question data. Uh, do not ever allow that to be uh, provided back to students. So if you do do any kind of after action review or some kind of report back to the student on how well they did, it should be feedback only, never question and answer pairs. And make sure to minimize the proctor and the raters access to the test instrument and the questions themselves. Anything else Clive, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, um, from my experience when we would put on tests, and it was a large fire district I worked with, um, we had a lot of candidates would come through for various promotions. And so we looked at the testing environment as just that. It wasn't a learning environment. And so we didn't use the raters to go and give feedback typically to the candidates because it, it just wasn't the best place in time and it could compromise the test. So we gave the raters the ability if they wanted to make a one or two sentence comment that would be provided in writing to the candidate after it had been reviewed by the, proctor, by the uh, test administrator for security. But otherwise we had the, both the candidates and the raters sign a confidentiality agreement saying that they wouldn't share the information and the raters were specifically told if these candidates contact you after the test, you are to tell them that you cannot speak with them. And so we were very restrictive on post-test behavior and conduct. And to take it even a step further, after a test was administered, we would keep the candidates in the test environment for a debrief that would take about a half hour or so. And part of the motivation for this was to keep them with us so that their brain could somewhat forget some of the testing they'd been through so they couldn't run outside right after a test, take notes, call their friends, or share the information. So it was sort of our way of brainwashing them for 30 <laughs> minutes so that they are help, help keep our tests secure. Sometimes we have to fight fire with fire. And so while we look at these five points of vulnerability, and we should compare the pros and cons of an analog versus a technological approach. And why do I say fight fire with fire? Because a lot of the new attack vectors are technological in nature, and so we're going to need to use technology to defeat some of these new approaches to cheating. So on the left-hand side, we can see the pros of paper-based testing, and there are some. Uh, Analog is not necessarily bad. It has some, some good aspects to it. Uh, no need to worry about test takers' unfamiliarity with computers or systems, for example. Uh, we can track some cheating behaviors through the erasure marks and other detections uh, based on looking at the actual answer sheets themselves. Uh, we have no need to dig digitally authenticate a test taker's identity. Once, we've given, once they've given us their identity, 
we can basically hand them a test instead of them having to authenticate to a computer system as well, and so on. We could go through all of these. The pros of technology are quite a few, uh, both in terms of security, in terms of our ability to standardize and institutionalize the process, and in terms of cost in the long run, and in terms of defensibility, because we can know every person who has touched seen or modified a computer file if done right, whereas on paper we lose those abilities. So if you're looking at techno technology mediated testing or technology facilitated testing, the two key elements that it's going to bring you are standardization. Uh, every test will be delivered and managed and administered and recorded in the same exact way. And you'll be able to enforce your policies and enforce access as well. Uh, whereas in paper testing, it's more difficult to do that. And I'd just, just like to add that one of the greatest benefits with this too on the standardization is the consistency. When we would have orientations before tests, we would say it multiple times for the candidates to read the instructions. Over and over again, the candidates would simply just do something that they were instructed to do differently. And it might have been something subtle, but that subtle difference would make a difference in their score because they didn't answer the question right. And it was in no intense purpose to trick them or anything like that. We would just re reiterate, read the instructions. And so by having technology and standardization, the people get used to the consistency and it helps them understand the process that much better. In the end, it's all about people, right, Clive? It is. And so this one's one of my favorite slides because this is really the foundation. If you create a culture in your organization, and we, we harped on this in the last class as well, but create a culture where you focus on career development. And so by tying all these together, we have policy. For my agency, we created the code of conduct. It was basically you're signing this saying that you will behave in the accordance with the badge you're wearing. You're going to wear it with pride and integrity. And so that policy helped outline how they should be, behave. On the leadership side, that was up to me to lead by example, to show them that I was going to help support them and I was going to have the same high bar to, to work by that they would. And then the last one, training, that was to create some kind of career development plan for the organization. A lot of times it's not that people aren't motivated to excel, they just don't necessarily have the best career path. And so as, as officers, if we, if we show them, you know, get your firefighter one, get your firefighter two, paramedic, officer certification, chief officer certification, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's. So if we give them a good career path, even tie in with some, some universities or something to help the process, if we give them that path, then they will embrace it and they'll follow your lead. And so if you create this culture, then when you do actually have an exam, you're going to have a less likely chance to get the cheating because they're going to look at it more as their opportunity to shine and live by that code of conduct that you set the example for. So now we'll open it up for questions. Uh, for those of you that want to ask questions, there is a little chat box or a question box in your lower left-hand corner of your screen. We're happy to take questions for both myself and Clive at this time. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, we do have a question here for you uh, to start off. How do you transition from paper-based testing to electronic? Uh, I'll take that, Clive. Uh, Ari here, the most important thing to think about when you're transitioning from paper to electronic testing is to have a solution or a system that can bridge both worlds. In other words, it's usually very difficult to transition directly from paper immediately into electronic if you're doing large-scale testing. And so you need a system that can actually produce the paper tests uh, for you for some proctored uh, sites that might not have computers available or might not have internet bandwidth available, while those that are more uh, computer-wired or have computers available you can do your testing there electronically. So you need a system capable of spanning both worlds. And I, I just want to add to that that in my department, one of the outlying volunteer stations is not staffed 
Um, when I first got hired and I went out there to visit, I saw about 40 boxes of legal um, cardboard boxes full of files in what used to be the kitchen at this fire station. And so when I asked the, the staff, I said, why do we have all these here? And they said, because the attic's already full. And so if I transitioning to electronic, it can also save a lot of storage. So even it, getting, getting old files scanned even would be a huge jump forward. Definitely. Uh, next question we have here. What do you do with test results if you have reasonable suspicion but no proof of cheating? I'll take this one. It's a, it's a really good question because it's very hard to prove cheating at times. Um, and so what we do is if, if you have a reasonable suspicion then you really need to address it because if you're put back up on the stand in court, if you're if you're sued civilly, you're going to have to defend why you let why you validated that test, knowing that it was compromised. And so you're going to have to take a look at what element of the test um, was compromised. So if it was the written test, you really need to throw that out. Um, if it was the whole test, then you have got to throw it out and start over. And even though that's going to be a huge hassle and it's going to cost some money. It's going to be far cheaper than moving forward, validating a test, and getting sued. Um, in fact, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Virginia Beach is in the news about uh, two, some firefighters that sued the department because a battalion chief who proctored an exam gave some information to two candidates. One scored 95 and the other one scored 100 on the test. And, so, uh, and they did not throw the test out. And so some candidates sued because they felt the test was unfair. And so whatever damages that department has to pay out is going to be far more than if they'd just redone the test. Got our next question here. What have you found to be the best device to take electronic testing with? The best device? Uh, we found that you can use a variety of different devices. Uh, you can use tablet uh, devices. Uh, that are running just Chrome on that tablet. You can use phones uh, to run the test. You can use computers to run the test. But if you want the most secure test, what's most important is that you control those devices. In other words, you don't allow a bring your own device scenario in your testing center ever. So you control uh, the tablets or the computers that the test is going to be taken on. But any variety of uh, devices running Android or iOS will work just fine. You know, I think it's a, something that comes to mind when we talk about controlling the devices. A couple of weeks ago, there was a great story on NPR about uh, graphing calculators and how they haven't changed since 1994. And the reasons they haven't changed since 1994 is because it took a long time for them to be accepted to be used in testing environments. And so the manufacturers have deliberately not added touch screens and different ways to communicate because then they would no longer be able to be used in a testing environment. So going back to what I already said, the more you can control, the better. And all you really need is a very lightweight tool, often just a browser. Uh, and so if you strip that component, that tablet, down to simply one app that's able to access only one IP address, that can be a very inexpensive way to digitize a classroom, and it can be a way to bring up a entire uh, proctored test center in any kind of facility that you might have. Hmm. All right, our next question here. Have you come up with a way to get out of paper testing for rural areas that have limited Internet access? So if you're doing the, the testing, in rural areas, it might be worthwhile finding an off-site location that can accommodate um, putting them in a location where it'll work, setting up something that might be uh, a remote temporary um, form of communication, or if there's a way to take the test offline. Um, but really, it, it kind of goes back to talking before about however much effort you put into it, that's how, how good the product's going to be coming out. And so, if you don't have good internet access and the best way to do it is through the internet, then, then find a location that will accommodate that. And I know it's, it's a hassle, but if you want to do it right, that's how you do it. And there are tools that will allow you to take tests offline. So it is possible to do that with a mobile device uh, to be able to take that test offline. The 
This is often done for observed skills tests, for example, where the skill sheets are downloaded onto a uh, mobile device and then scored offline. And then once those devices are brought back into a networked environment or a Wi-Fi environment, the scores can be automatically updated to the central testing server. So there are ways to accommodate that as well. Yeah, this is, uh, could be a related question. What do you recommend for smaller agencies that don't have the resources to put on detailed testing processes? It's a, it's a good question. Um, smaller agencies really should, should look towards their, their neighbors and what they do uh, when they do conduct tests and see if they can't set up a it's like joint powers agreement to do a collaborative test. That way you bring all the potential, say, uh, entry level or captain candidates in together and it's done um, as a group of, say, five different agencies. They all run these, these candidates through and then the end product would then be used by each agency. Um, so you, you might have to make the testing a little more vanilla, generic it a little bit with some general terminology versus independent policies from agency specific. But that being said, the end product is also going to be a group of firefighters that are then going to work better together in neighboring agencies because now they know operations and they have better familiarity. And so there's a, a way then to share the cost and potentially have a better product when you're done having worked with your neighbor closer. That's great feedback, Clive. And, and also, if you're a small agency and you can't have a collaborative environment for some reason, uh, where you don't have neighbors that are willing or able to set that up for you, just being aware of the potential uh, vectors for having your test breached and being able to set up policies and procedures not that hard actually to set up the policies and procedures, and that's half the battle. The other half is technological, but if you just solve half the battle, you're already much better off than you were before. And, and I think that's another great point is with the internet, we live in a very small world, and so it doesn't even necessarily have to be a direct neighbor, but some networking that you've done through maybe a class at the National Fire Academy or going, you know, we have FDIC in a couple of weeks. And so if you meet somebody at a conference, another chief of a similar type demographic agency, contact them. You know, I've got this group of uh, chiefs that I've, I've been in circles with. And a few weeks ago, one of them sent out an email asking for a template on the letter of reprimand. And so I just sent one over and then another chief chimed in and said, thanks, I could use one too. And so having that network will help you set that base when you need help for a testing process. It doesn't have to be a direct neighbor. Okay, guys, our next question here describes a uh, little bit of a challenge that this person has to deal with. I want to transition our department to electronic, but I don't trust our city's system because so many other city departments have access. What should I do? Uh, well, number one, you should look for a system that allows you to control your own uh, universe of data. And this is a common problem when you have a system that's being provided maybe by your city or by your state that doesn't give you control over your own security and control over your own uh, universe of data for your test questions and your test instruments. So as you look at it, don't throw away the notion of digital testing just because right now you may have a city uh, that is trying to provide you something that doesn't give you that level of control. Go and find it or ask for it from the city and say, I want to have my own sandbox in here to be able to do my own things. Most modern testing systems will allow you to have security that is granular, sufficiently granular for you to own and manage and track your own test questions and your own instruments. And so just demand that. And one of the other key benefits of that is not just the, the privacy and the security, but it might be more specific and focused towards what you're doing. So if you work, like say in a large county that I came from, um, our human resources department managed every other department in the county. And so when it came to doing a promotional exam for the fire district, they weren't specialized in that, so they did a very broad approach. And so if you go with a specialized program that focuses on the testing you need, it might be a better test on top of the, the added security. That's great, guys. 
Uh, looks like this is our last question here. How do you create a culture that welcomes testing to prove themselves versus just another promotional exam? So we talked about leadership. We talked about the training and policy to build that, that behavior in your agency that would help um, create that culture with the career development. Um, but then I think to follow up on that, it would be create orientations and, and go through like what an exam will be. So when we would have an exam a few months beforehand, we would bring in all the candidates, anybody who's interested, and say this is the stuff that you should be focusing on. And it wasn't saying when you get this question, the answer is C. It's saying, hey, we've had some challenges with uh, structural firefighting and high rises lately. And so we really want guys to start focusing in on this training. And so you, you start with that career development-minded uh, environment but you go through these orientation programs to show that your employees that you want them to succeed. And, and by having that culture, it's gonna not just discourage cheating, but I can tell you from the department I work at, the guys wouldn't cheat on a test, and I can say that very confidently, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't cheat on a test because they wouldn't want to disappoint their, their brothers and sisters in the department. And so focus on that leadership, supporting your members, um, and then, like I said, we, we would have orientations that help keep them more informed. Yep. Thanks, Clyde. Uh, looks like we've answered all the questions. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, thank Clive and Ari for providing their expertise today. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending. Uh, again, we've recorded this webinar. We'll send you a link to it in the coming days uh, so that each of you can share it. And in addition, shortly you're going to receive a survey regarding today's webinar. Please take a few moments to fill it out. We'd love to get your feedback. We'd like to hear what other topics you'd like for us to cover in the future as well. Uh, so that's it for today. Please join us for the final webinar in this mini-series on high-stakes testing as we cover what you should consider before investing in testing software as a solution to cheating. Have a great afternoon, everyone.